Hello and welcome into another episode of Locked on Wolves. Today on the show, previewing the Timberwolves starting lineup, what the Timberwolves need from Julius Randle in his first season in a Wolves uniform. How can he best fit in? Also, next steps for Jaden McDaniels this year. We'll also talk about the final Wolves roster spot. There still needs to be some stuff ironed out there. It's all coming. Welcome in. You are Locked on Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves, your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beek and I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. Today's episode is brought to us by FanDuel. You can start your season with a big return on FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet. We'll get you started with 200 Dollars in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit fanduel.com to get started. Happy Monday, everybody. Hopefully, you had a fantastic weekend. Tomorrow is the day, opening night, Wolves in LA to take on the Lakers. In fact, on Tuesday's show, I'm actually going to do a crossover episode with uh, the Kamenetsky brothers from Lockdown Lakers to talk Wolves Lakers. So, looking forward to that conversation on Tuesday. We'll preview kind of both sides of the matchup, probably talk a little bigger picture for the season as well. So very much looking forward to that. That means that today, today, I've got to knock out the whole preview of the starting lineup. We've been kind of going through mostly player by player, but we're running out of time here. So I want to talk about like my two biggest things that I need to see from the Timberwolves starting lineup. We'll hit a, co- hit a couple other things along the way. So we're going to talk a lot about Julius Randle, a little bit about Jade McDaniels today as well. So we'll get to that here in just a moment. First of all, a big thank you off the top for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can find Lockdown Wolves. You can also watch on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. And you can follow on X at Lockdown T Wolves and also at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K E N. All right. Um, I should note actually here off the top, let's talk about the the roster very quickly. Um it was reported on Saturday that Kata Bates Diop was not at Timberwolves practice. I think John Krasinski of the Athletic had that first. And it, it was reported elsewhere. I think Jake Fisher had out there that the Wolves are trying to trade Kata Bates Diop, obviously, because if they like everybody on this roster, they have 16 guys that have guaranteed money. I've said all along PJ Dozier makes the most sense to waive because he's only got like a million bucks guaranteed. It's it's at least been reported previously that it's not a fully guaranteed deal. If it is, it maybe matters a little bit less. But because if all things are equal, fine. If you if you're worried about roster balance, you want somebody else that can handle the ball in a pinch. You want the veteran presence, whatever. I mean, at this point, Kade Bates Diop is also a veteran presence. But there's some duplication of skill sets. Like he plays a similar role to Josh Minot and Leonard Miller. Like if you want somebody who can, in a pinch, like again, you're talking about the 15th guy on the roster. So like you're in big trouble. And anyway, if that guy is the one that's initiating your offense, but I understand. You know, in behind the scenes stuff, obviously Tim Connolly really likes PJ Dozier. That's clear. So. I don't know if all things are equal, like if these guys both have this essentially the same guaranteed money, then fine. It doesn't really matter. And KBD probably has more trade value. And I'm sure that's the Wolves thought process is maybe we get a second round pick for, for Bates Diop because he can be a rotation guy. Um, but if they're, you know, you're going to pay a million plus more by keeping Dozier and waving Bates Diop because they have guaranteed money, then I don't know. That, that makes a ton of sense. So anyway, something to watch. Maybe by the time you're listening to this, there's been an announcement Monday. They have until end of business Monday to make a choice on what they're going to do there. Ultimately, it's the 15th roster spot. Not a major deal either way, but I thought it was important to point that out here off the top. All right. Let's talk about the starting lineup. So, you know, same, same, you know, four of the five same starters as last year. And then obviously Julius Randle in the Carl Anthony Town spot. And, and, you know, I said right after the trade, it was pretty clear he was going to start. Nas was going to come off the bench. We talked about Nas and DiVincenzo in the bench unit on, I think, Thursday of last week. Um, so I want to talk about Julius Randle's fit with the starting lineup. And this is a little bit different than a straight Julius Randle preview. And it's a little bit more developed than what I said immediately following the trade when the Wolves landed Randle a couple of weeks ago. And of course, I did, you know, an immediate reaction show. I did a show with Alex Wolf from Locked on Knicks. Like we did the whole thing, covered it from every angle. But I want to unpack this now that we're on the eve of opening night and talk about like, what's the best case role for him? Like, what's the ideal role for Julius Randle within within the Wolves starting lineup? Um, I think the, the, the there's a couple angles. Like, I want to talk about defense, but we have to start with offense. As long as Julius Randle, like Julius Randle's done a lot of different things throughout his career. He's he's 
you know, early in his career, he was, you know, top pick by the Lakers, broke his leg in his rookie season. And there was this anticipation that he could be like a top flight power forward scorer. He'd develop a, a stretch for game, but could bully in the post. And he did do that to some extent with New Orleans. He played a little bit faster pace. He played with some other bigs. And that was, you know, with Chris Finch for, I think, only a season in New Orleans. He ends up in New York and then he became kind of this isolation threat. Right from the from the high post, from the mid post, uh, free throw line extended jab steps and and spinning into the lane and hitting tough jumpers over guys and getting to the rim and drawing fouls and just kind of being a bowling ball, and that's kind of what this has turned into, and it can be effective, it absolutely can. The question is within the Wolves half court offense with Anthony Edwards on the floor, as long as Julius Randle knows he is the second option, clearly the second option then I, I think it can work. Even if it's not quite as smooth as like a guy that has infinite range, like Carl Anthony Towns that can play anywhere, that can score at all three levels. Julius Randle, well, he can shoot a three. Um, you know, we saw him in the preseason game last week in, in the only uh, the game against the Bulls. He didn't shoot a single three. He only shot twos. And there were times that the Knicks where the volume of three-pointers increased and he was even the three-point contest last year. He only has had one season above like 36% from deep. And that was a year when he shot like 41%. But there's no, that was an outlier. He, he do, isn't truly a three-level scorer in the same way and certainly not in the same efficiency as Carl Anthony Towns was. So there's certain areas on the floor where he can be most impactful. But as long as he knows he's clearly the second option, and there's there's evidence already to suggest that he does. We saw early in the Bulls game where he almost, you know, he deferred too much to Ant to the point where, you know, Ant was going to cut, let Randall go to work, and Randall went to kick it to Ant and cut away from the ball to let Ant go to work, and the ball went out of bounds because they were both trying to be unselfish. That was preseason. So who knows when, when, you know, like to, when, when it gets, get down to, gets down to brass tacks, right. In, in an actual NBA regular season game, like what's, what's going to change. I think with Ant on the floor, Randall can do a little bit of what he did at stages earlier in his career. And at times last year with the Knicks, which is space to the corners. And I, I said this with cat last year and I wanted cat to do that more often. And I, I understand that that would be underutilizing what Carl Anthony Towns can do. And there's no question cats, a better shooter than Julius Randall, but to give Anthony Edwards maximum space, knowing that like with the starting lineup, Rudy Gobert is going to be on the floor, which automatically you can't truly play five out because nobody's guarding Rudy. If he's standing in the corner, Randall at least will command some respect. And he was a good enough three point shooter, at least last year. To, to show that that could work on some level for Minnesota. Last season, Julius Randle, despite only being, what was his overall three-point shooting percentage? 31% last season. But he shot almost 53% on corner threes. 52.8%. And about 15% of his threes came from the corner. So not a ton. But it, it, it also, I should say, that the track record for his career, he's 37% on corner threes for his career, which is a little bit low, right? Like that's about league average overall for three point shooting, but from the corners, that number should be North of 40%. And he was only 33% two years ago, 29% the year before that. But his second year in New York, when he had the great three point shooting season, more than a fifth of his threes came from the corners. He was 41% from the corners. So all that to say, Randall can be a dangerous shooter from the corners. He's certainly going to be more dangerous than Kyle Anderson was. And he, Rudy isn't a threat at all from out there. So spacing Randall to the corners when ants on the floor makes a lot of sense. If Rudy Gobert's on the bench and Nas reads in the game and Randall's playing next to Nas, you can play five out or you can put Randall in the dunker spot. And he's a pretty dynamic guy, more certainly more dangerous as an offensive threat, albeit smaller, but more dangerous as an offensive threat, more versatile as an offensive threat than Rudy Gobert. If if the Wolves are playing four out with Nas on the perimeter and putting Randall in the dunker, you know, Nas is technically playing center, but Randall's functioning as the center offensively. That could be really dangerous. If Julius Randle's the guy, we actually saw this at one point in the preseason game against the Bulls, where Randle's the guy getting the dump off from Anthony Edwards. Or from, you know, more likely than not, it's Ant, but whoever else, you know, DiVincenzo, or whoever's attacking from the perimeter, and it's not Rudy, and Nas can stay spaced on the perimeter, that could be really dynamic if Julius Randle's the one standing in the dunker spot and, and benefiting from, from Ant's dynamism, if you will, on the perimeter. All right. I want to talk about like what that role looks like when Ant's not on the floor and a couple other things. We'll talk about defense too. And then we'll talk a little Jaden McDaniels here uh, as we get deeper into the show. We'll do all that here next. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is sponsored by BetterHelp. What's something that scares you? Think about it. 
Think about a fear, no matter how big or small it might be. I mean, it's that time of year where, of course, Halloween lets us have fun with what scares us. It seems, you know, corny. We're, what, 10 days away from Halloween. But what about the fears that don't involve zombies and ghosts and everything else that comes with this time of, you know, the start of the holiday season? Therapy can be a great tool for facing your fears and finding ways to overcome them. Genuine fears. Because sometimes the scariest thing is not facing our fears in the first place. And you hold yourself back. You don't give yourself a chance to overcome whatever those fears might be. If you're thinking about starting therapy, consider giving BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, and it's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. You can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Again, all you have to do is fill out that questionnaire. You get matched with a licensed therapist, and at any time, you can switch your therapist for an additional charge. Overcome your fears with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash NBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P.com slash NBA. All right, uh, let's talk. continue to talk about Julius Randle's fit with the Timberwolves starting lineup. So I talked about him in the corner when Ant's on the floor, just spacing to the corner. Don't, don't, don't muddle things if you don't have to. Don't overthink it, right? And, and, and I truly think the Wolves could have benefited from doing that more with Carl Anthony Towns. And the way I've described this in the past, not to get too far down this rabbit hole, but think about how Bogdanovich was used in the Conley, Rudy Gobert, Donovan Mitchell, Utah Jazz teams. Dude was like, 49% or something from the corners I get. And he's a legit score. I know that towns is more talented and more versatile as a player than Bogdanovich, but that was a pretty effective use. That was the top offense in the West. One of those years. So there, there's spacing to the corners is not, and Randall's not the shooter that Bogdanovich is or was, and he's not the shooter that cat is or was, but he can be impactful. And he was over. What did I say? He was last year. 50% from the corners. Yeah. 52.8% last year on corner threes. I don't know. See if it's real or not. Try putting him in the corners. If if Rudy's not on the floor, put him in the dunker. I also think if they're going to play, you know, if Rudy's on the floor and Rudy's in the dunker and, and say Randall's not in the corner and they run some other action, having Randall be your second side attacker, if Ant's going to work on the right wing and, you know, somebody's got to stunt at him as he gets inside the three-point line, swinging that ball quickly to Randall and Randall with the second side attack on a quick, you know, just catch and go. Don't even pump fake because they're probably not going to respect that. You know, if it's if it's Ant or Conley, you know, say Ant's on the right wing, he swings it to Conley, who swings it to Randall. Like Ant and Randall, or excuse me, Ant and Conley are far more dangerous as shooters from the perimeter than Julius Randall is. So defenses aren't necessarily, at least they shouldn't respect a Randall pump fake. If he could just rip it and go off the catch and just jet to the basket or roll, bowling ball roll, I don't mean that in a bad way, like uh, muscle his way to the basket as he does. There's going to be an advantage there. And I think the Wolves are going to have better perimeter shooting around him than what he had it with the Knicks. Like I know Brunson's a dynamic scorer, but uh, you know, the 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 Wolves were actually the best three-point shooting team in the entire league last year by percentage when it was all said and done. I, I think that's easily forgotten and easily missed because they didn't shoot enough of them. But they have a really dynamic team from outside the arc. And I've said this so many times. Rudy's the only guy in their top eleven, top twelve that can't shoot threes at a league average or better clip. And he just doesn't shoot them. But everybody else is is dangerous. So swinging the ball to Randall and having him decisively attack off the catch within the rotation, and then if Rudy's off the floor, he can go to the dunker with Ant off the with Ant off the floor. The offense can run through Julius Randall, similar to how it did at times with the Knicks, where you could put if he wants to play at the top of the circle and attack off the dribble, fine, because he's good enough. It's not like. If that if he's your number one option and that's your offense, you're probably a 500 team. Like that's I, I'm obviously oversimplifying things. Like there's other stuff that matters, but uh, like that that's the easiest way to say it. So with Ant off the floor, if you play offense like a 500 team, but when Ant's on the floor, you're a top five offense or whatever you end up hopefully being. Obviously, that wasn't the case last year, but as Ant continues to get better, I mean that's fine. If that's your baseline is is a mediocre to above average offense with Ant off the floor because it's running through Randall, that's great. We'll take that. So whether it's top of the circle or if it's free throw line extended, that mid post where like almost like where Jokic likes to get the ball a lot for Denver, where Randall can jab step and shoot his contested mid range jumper if he wants to. He can attack to the middle. He likes to attack toward the elbow and then spin to the middle of the floor and hit a tough kind of fall away jumper, but also draw contact, finish through contact, which he's so good at doing. And and you know, maybe get all the way to the rim. I've talked before, like the the 
thing that Randall brings that's unquestionably better than Carl Anthony Towns is the ability to get to the free throw line. And that's one way he can do it is when ants off the floor, just attacking. And he's a, he shot 78% from the line last year, 75% for his career. So he's not cat from the line, but he gets there more frequently to the point where that's going to be a plus for the wolves offense, because he gets there so much more than cat and makes them at nearly the same, nearly as good of a clip as cat. That's going to impact the wolves offense in a positive way. And then the last thing for Julius that, that, I, I shouldn't phrase this as the last thing, but like the thing that there may be less possessions that are impacted this way over the course of a game, but it fits with some of the stuff myself and also Chris Finch have been talking about the Wolves needing to improve this year. In transition, grab and go. Julius Randle's got to grab a board and just go. And he did that in New Orleans under when Chris Finch was the associate head coach and uh, I think coordinated the offense for the Pelicans at the time. If Randle could just be that dynamic player in the open floor where he gets a rebound and goes, and I get that he's 30 now, or he's about to turn 30 in like a month. Um, but that's still an advantage he's going to have over other guys playing the four. He's still going to be more explosive than a lot of these other players. So if he can, in transition, which is an area of the Wolves, have left possessions on the floor. And I don't want to go too deep down this path either. I've talked about this plenty. But the Timberwolves run enough off of steals, and they force enough turnovers, and they jump passing lanes, they do a good job with deflections but they don't run off defensive rebounds. They were dead last in the entire league last year and running off of defensive rebounds. And I'm not saying they should run every time, but like when Rudy's off the floor, if it's Randall and Nas out there, make it a track beat. They still have enough length, athleticism, overall size, and I would say defensive intelligence to be effective defensively with Rudy off the floor. And they were last year. They were still a decent defensive team with Gobert off the floor. And this is playing, knowing your personnel, knowing who's on the floor, who's off the floor, and the coaching staff reminding the players, hey, look, Rudy's off the floor. Let's push it. Let's push the pace. Rudy's off the floor. Let's put Randall in the dunker and and space out everybody else in the perimeter and play four out. Rudy's on the floor. Let's slow it down because we're the best half-court defense by far in the entire league. Put Rudy in the dunker. Randall can space to the corner. Let Ant go to work. Run your sets, whatever. And then Randall's attacking off the catch, second side attack. Like that. It, there, there's so many, there's so much flexibility. There's so many options here with this, with this team. And that was the case with cat too. And I, I, you know, some of these things were also true last year and I just don't think they did it a good enough job, but Randall's going to be better at catching and going in transition at rebounding and going in transition than cat was cat was a bit frenetic. The de- defensive rebounding, I thought, you know, took a, a bit of a downturn the last couple of years. Obviously he was further away from the rim more frequently uh, than he had been when he played center, of course. Uh, but I think that's one of the areas Randall's very good at. And the Wolves need to do better at as a team. And I'm not saying that not having Cat will make it easier to do better. I just think it's more of a focus of the coaching staff now to impart this on the on the players. Like, hey, we're leaving some easy buckets on the table by not pushing in transition. And, and you know, free throw rate. And the Wolves are a great three-point shooting team. What's the best way to get open threes and to get to the line? It's transition. It's going against a defense that is not set, that's backpedaling, that's trying to recover. And the Wolves have the personnel to be successful doing just that. My last point on Julius Randle before we shift gears, talk a bit of Jaden here toward the end of the show, is defensively. They need Julius Randle to do basically what Carl Anthony Towns did defensively last year. And this is, I think, going to be a bit tricky. Because Cat sacrificed last year. Cat had been seen as a negative defender for most of his career, and for a good chunk of the time, that was true. He was he was not and is not a rim protector, at least not in the traditional sense. He got some blocks here and there, but that wasn't what he was. He wasn't good in drop coverage in the Ryan Saunders, David Vanter pool scheme. That did not work. But when Chris Finch installed a blitzing scheme, a a uh, you know playing at the level and being even more aggressive than that on the perimeter scheme, Carlton Towns, I, don't, I, I would say, eventually flourished last year. And a couple of years ago, he was really good in that scheme. Um, and they could drop when Rudy was in the action. They could do other stuff when Cat was in the action. And it worked out really well. But I brought this up so many times. Cat was awesome guarding Kevin Durant in round one last year. He was awesome guarding Nikola Jokic in round two last year. And he wasn't as impactful defensively in round three because mismatches can exploit Carl Anthony Towns. He struggles to guard guys with a mismatch. Well, Julius Randle's going to be better against mismatches, but will he be better straight up? Will he buy into the team concept? We've seen both things throughout Julius Randle's career. He's had seasons where he's been a plus defender, and I thought better than even than maybe what Carl Anthony Towns was last year because he's so switchable. He's better with lateral quickness. He has a similar base, you know, even stronger like base strength, core strength than Carl Anthony Towns. But other times he just looks kind of lazy defensively. And I thought that was pretty eradicated from Cat's game last year for the most part. Like, Cat had moments, sure. 
But uh, who doesn't, first of all? Second of all, I thought he was really bought in. When he was in drop coverage and he was the rim protector, he would just kind of throw his hands up and do the thing where he was a half step late, tried to block the shot, kind of, but it was really more just to look like he tried. That didn't happen last year from Carl Anthony Towns. Randall will do stuff like that sometimes. So have those off ball space cadet type moments. And, and like Ant will do that too. You can't have multiple guys doing that if you're going to be the best defense in the league. And if you don't leave yourself much offensive margin for error, you have to still be a really good defense. So I, that's something to keep an eye on is what's Julius Randall going to provide defensively for the Wolves? Will he be able to do at, at minimum what Carl Anthony Towns did last year? All right, let's close the show by talking about Jaden McDaniels, what we need to see from him this season and his fit within the starting lineup. We'll do that here next. Today's episode of Locked Out Wolves is brought to us by our friends at FanDuel. Hey, fans, you can start your season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. When you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. If you're an NFL fan, a big Sunday of action. Of course, the Vikings lost a tough one to the Lions. The NFC North is crazy with, what, three teams with five wins? I think there's three other teams total in the NFL with five wins, at least before the Chiefs play um, this week. But... Uh, lots of fun in the NFL slate this week. And of course, NBA win totals. Now is the time to jump on those before the regular season kicks off on Tuesday night, Boston in action in game one. And of course the wolves in game two, Minnesota's over under at FanDuel still 51 and a half wins. I would take the over on that. The Lakers, by the way, we're going to talk about this with the Kamenetsky brothers of lockdown Lakers. They're over under is 42 and a half. I, like, I mean, that feels about right. They're supposed to feel about right. That's a tough one for me. I probably take a slight under with the Lakers this year. We'll see. JJ Reddick's first year coaching. Uh, the roster mostly looking the same as it did last year. So go check out the win totals over at FanDuel as well. You can get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Again, place a $5 bet. Your first one, get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed over at FanDuel. That's FanDuel.com. Let's close by talking a bit about Jaden McDaniels. Of course, Jaden last season was solid and he was, you know, all defense second team was very much on the national radar for his defense as he should have been. And it was clear like early in the season, remember he had a quad or a hamstring like the first couple weeks and, and missed a couple games early and ultimately missed 10 games during the season last year. Um, and the defense I thought was, was generally better than it had been. It obviously had always been good. But the offense slipped a little bit, and he had something of an offensive breakout in 22-23. It didn't get noticed nationally simply because uh, like he was so good defensively and the team wasn't as good two years ago as they were this year. Um, but that season, Jaden shot, this is 22-23, okay? So when the Wolves were the eighth seed and lost to the Nuggets in the first round, he was 39.8% from outside the arc, 40%. Year prior, he was 32%. First season in rookie year, he was 36%. Last year, he was under 34% from three. And we saw that we saw that take a hit. The other thing is I thought he looked a little bit less decisive. And I think maybe that kind of manifested after he got off the tough start shooting and was a little less confident in the three point shot. Um, we did see the three point rate slightly increase overall. It just it wasn't as successful of a shot. He got to the line a lot less because he got into this like obsession with that 10 foot like duck his head fade away like really tough, almost like what LeBron does, except for Jaden kind of hangs in the air and, and the shot comes from behind the head. It just, it doesn't look comfortable for Jay. Actually, no, his doesn't come. It's more, he leans back where he's like almost horizontal and he's shooting it like, like his body's at like a 45 degree angle or something like that. It's weird. And it's not super effective. And occasionally he makes it. It's like, Oh, Jaden McDaniels. And if, if you're watching a national TV, you don't watch the Wolves regularly. You're like, Oh man, this kid, you know, he's gonna learn how to score. That's not what the wolves want him doing. He needs to be more decisive with either catch and shoot, pump fake and get to the rim, or create for somebody else in between instead of these in-the-middle jumpers or the hesitation on the three-point shot. That's what I would wish for uh, from Jaden in this season. Number one is just more decisiveness. And I do think the three-point percentage is going to come up. I don't know that he's a 40% three-point shooter, but I think he's better than 34%. I think he showed enough touch to do that. I think it's more a confidence thing than anything else. And again, got off to the tough start last year, and it, I think it ate away at that confidence. But if he can be just a bit more uh, decisive, that would be number one. The other thing is something that he unlocked a bit in the playoffs, and the Wolves as a team unlocked. Now, I, this was clearly part of the game plan. Leading into the Suns series last year, I talked about on this show how the Suns were a bad 
rebounding team. We knew that they were going to play small. We knew Kevin Durant was going to play a lot of five with injuries. They basically didn't have, they had like one center and Durant played some five. He, he played the four, but he wasn't playing the five. The Wolves had a massive size advantage and there was going to be opportunity for the Wolves. Uh, the Suns were not a great defensive rebounding team. The Wolves are spotty as offensive rebounders because they don't generally cl- crash the glass. It was the perfect opportunity for the Wolves to take advantage on the offensive glass and to have corner crashers and specifically Jade McDaniels. And that's what he did. Last season, and I'm just going to compare playoffs to regular season, not specifically the four games against the Suns, but overall for the playoffs, Jade McDaniels had an offensive rebound rate of 6.2% last year. It was 3.2% in the regular season and 3.9% for his career. That's nearly twice the offensive rebound rate. If you just want to talk rebounds, offensive rebounds per game, which for a small sample like this, I think is a fine way to look at it. He last year averaged 0.8 offensive rebounds per game. So under one for the playoffs last year, 16 games, he averaged 1.8 offensive rebounds per game. So a full offensive rebound more per game, nearly two per game in the playoffs. A lot of that was in the Phoenix series. A lot of it was a, a concerted effort by the Wolves to corner crash to try and get a rebound in a dunk or rebound and, and go back up and get a layup or get fouled or kick it to the opposite corner, perhaps, or to the back to the perimeter for a second chance opportunity. That's not an all the time thing, but I think Jaden now, after seeing that success in the playoffs, he's going to see this is a thing that I, I can get easy buckets this way. I could pick my spots. Now you have to be careful against your opponent against Phoenix. That was going to work, but against a team that wants to run a bunch that has athletes, maybe a, a younger team or a team that's not as good in the half court. So they're going to try and, run more, create more variance on the fast break, then, you know, you don't want to do that, right? You got that guy in the corner. You got to get back. You got to beat your man back so they don't get a layup or an open corner three on the other end. And that's, that was a huge problem two years ago. Last year, the, the, excuse me, the transition defense was much better. And it was the concerted effort of like, Hey, we're not going to crash the glass. We're going to recover. We're going to contest. Um, or we're going to, once we shoot, we're not going to linger. We're not going to do the Andrew Wiggins float in the middle, not crash the offensive glass or not get back. We're just going to get back. But I think Jaden specifically because of his length, athleticism, and uh, also he's so good at recovering anyway. If he doesn't get the rebound, he can sprint back and use his length and his his long strides to uh, you know get back and and be a factor on the defensive end of the floor. But there's opportunities for Jaden to get an easy bucket a game, a cheap bucket a game by crashing from the corners. Again, it won't be all the time, but it's something that they could pick their spots with and he could be really effective. So decisiveness, which I think will lead to more free throw attempts, which dipped last year for him, more open three-point attempts and a better three-point percentage and offensive rebounding for Jaden McDaniels will go a long way. I don't have anything else to say about Ant. I've talked a lot about Ant this offseason. It's been a big Ant offseason for good reason. Mike Conley, we've talked about, like if he could just keep shooting threes and they can get him some more rest here and there during the season, um, he'll be just fine. Like Obviously, he wore down last year As a one-on-one defender, he's not as effective as he once was, not even close. Uh, But he's still a good team defender and can still be the straw that stirs the drink for the Wolves. Uh, So nothing else to say there. We talked about Randall. I just and and Rudy, you know, same deal. Like Rudy's going to be the same guy offensively for the Wolves. So still, I think the Wolves very likely could have the best top eight of any team in the NBA. Almost certainly top seven. You could put Nikhil up against any other top eight, you know, eighth player to rotation anywhere. I think we could have a real conversation. Uh, but overall, the the top eight for the Wolves is fantastic. All right, Tuesday, we're going to do a preview. I'll do a little bit of my own stuff, but most of the show will be a crossover between myself and the Kamenetsky brothers of Lockdown Lakers. They do an awesome job. We'll be previewing Wolves-Lakers on Tuesday night. So we'll talk a bit about that, uh, you know, around the crossover portion of the show Tuesday. We'll do a uh, the post-game pod on Wednesday. It'll actually, the YouTube will probably post, well, I suppose it will be Wednesday morning because it's like a 9 p.m. tip central. So early Wednesday, you'll get an episode, the post game pod following Wolves Lakers on Tuesday night. A big thank you for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every single day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can find Lockdown Wolves. You can also watch on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV, and you can follow on X at Lockdown T Wolves and also at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K E N. Of course, for your second listen, you could go check out Lockdown Fantasy Basketball. You can become a fantasy basketball expert and get the edge over your league mates with daily tips from Josh Lloyd. Find Lockdown Fantasy Basketball on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.